Um, okay, so uh, we were talking about Bayesian procedures and uh, we considered this um, a couple of examples basically of how you can calculate the posterior. Uh, and there was this Bernoulli example or binomial example with uh, beta prior. And uh, we also discussed this uh, normal location family. And um, so the idea is that in this case, if you have a normal location family uh, with mean um, uh, being the desired parameter or a known parameter, sigma squared being known, uh, then uh, a Gaussian prior would be conjugate. So you put a Gaussian prior on theta. Um, and then you can calculate the um, posterior using uh, the general idea that the posterior is proportional to the likelihood times the prior. And sometimes I would write it like that. Um, or you can um, use the properties of the multivariate normal distributions to sort of reason a little bit easier um, or more easily uh, about the, what the, the distribution should be. So we can uh, sort of observe that. The, Joint distribution of theta and x one to x n is Gaussian because you can write it as a linear transformation of theta and a bunch of independent noise. Um, so the theta and x one to x n uh, is a linear transformation of uh, this underlying vector. And these are independent. So this is as I argue, not I argue, but independent coordinates. Uh, so individually, um, well, marginally, they're Gaussian. So the joint is multivariate Gaussian. And then we have a mapping, uh, which is linear, which I let you figure out. It's yeah, straightforward to see that uh, this vector would take from that vector by linear mapping. And so it's going to be multivariate normal. It has a certain mean and a certain covariance structure. The mean is zero. The covariance is uh, you can calculate. And then once you have the covariance, then uh, you can calculate the um, posterior of this piece given the rest. Um, and that would be um, Gaussian with a certain mean. Again, mean turns out to be zero. Uh, and the covariance, which is related to the shore complement, okay, uh, of the original covariance, the shore complement of the original covariance matrix. Uh, so once the dust settles, this is going to be the posterior, okay? So I encourage you to go through this machinery. For yourself. Um, and um, so, would anyone uh, be able to like, close the door? Maybe? Thank you. Um, yes. Can you put some of these slides here? Uh, maybe not. Maybe do that. Just, yeah. Okay, I'm going to do that. Uh, yes. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, sure, sure. Sorry. Yeah. Um, the, uh, well, maybe I did. Did I? Yes. Okay. <laughs> sure, I'll do that after the class. So what the um, what the end result is something like that. And uh, what we have is uh, a normal distribution with mean being again like a linear combination um, of the mean of the prior, the prior mean is mu, um, and what turns out to be the NLE in this case, which is the uh, average of um, Xi's. Uh, and so this lambda n, um, you can write it as uh, the ratio of uh, tau squared. So what is tau squared? Uh, tau squared is one over b squared, and b is the variance of the prior. So tau squared is really the precision. So the inverse of the variance is called the precision. So the precision of the prior divided by this tau tilde, which is um, which turns out to be the precision of the posterior. So this is the variance of the posterior, so the inverse of it is um, tau tilde squared, which is the precision of the posterior. And it turns out that that's uh, given by that, uh, which is very um, like interpretable, right? So you have uh, the precision of the prior uh, plus n times the uh, precision of the likelihood, sort of, that, not the likelihood, but the marginal, uh, conditional distribution. So each sample that comes in brings this much, like reduces uh, the uncertainty by this much, basically. 
So you get uh, n times the precision of the uh, conditional distribution xi given theta uh, plus the precision of the prior. So the precision linearly or like finally increases with the number of samples. And because this is the ratio of the precision of the prior to the precision of the posterior, this goes to zero as it increases. Because the precision of the posterior is like increasing, goes to zero. So the posterior mean is going to converge to x bar. And at the same time, x bar itself converges to the uh, true parameter. We'll see that this is a consequence of the law of large numbers if you have uh, IAB samples from um, a normal family. But, but for our case, uh, the posterior mean basically concentrates around the x bar and the, the variance sort of shrinks. Okay. So this again captures the idea that the posterior becomes more informative and also moves to where you expect it should, should be. That, that it should be like the permanent. Okay. So the effect of the prior is going to die down. Okay. If the sample size is small, uh, this is going to be closer to. Uh, Let's say uh, small, it would be, it's only like uh, zero one, but it would be closer to one, so you'd have more more uh, weight on the prior. Okay, and um, it just gives you a nice way of trading off prior information and uh, your data. Okay, sounds good. Uh, yeah, skip this part. Um, Okay, so one more point is that this, again, posterior mean is the Bayes rule or the Bayes estimator, if you want, under the quadratic loss. So if we specify the quadratic loss, talk about what is the optimal uh, estimator under the Bayes risk, uh, then this is your solution. Yeah. Any questions? Like a few words again about conjugate priors. So conjugacy is this idea that I have a family of uh, priors. Uh, they're called conjugate to a family of likelihoods uh, if whenever I uh, form the posteriors based on this pair, the, the posteriors are within the same family as the prior. Okay. So for example, if you have the normal, uh, this is the prior family, um, the likelihood being normal, these are conjugate, okay? Conjugate pair, or, or like normal is conjugate, a conjugate prior for normal likelihood. Beta is a conjugate prior for binomial. Extension to multivariate would be the same, uh, same as the previous one, but for multivariate, it's like ratio and multinomial. So if you have multinomial likelihood, uh, Richley is the uh, conjugate prior. And then in general, you can write down like an exponential family. These are all examples of exponential family. And write an exponential family and then look at the posterior. So the, like you could look at it as a likelihood. You can see that it's it's a uh, dependence on theta looks like this. So um, imagine the prior that has the same sort of dependence exponential sum for the a theta theta here plus the uh, a theta. And if you multiply these two, you can see that you're just updating px to px plus a. Uh, and, and this coefficient of a to you. Uh, B minus A. And so if this thing's normalizes, then it gives you uh, a conjugate prior to that general normal, sorry, the exponential family, except that in general, this might not be very useful because it's not necessarily an easy prior to work with, but in some cases, it turns out to be um, reasonable. Okay. Uh, Nothing much else like to say about conjugate priors. Any questions? Okay. Um, improper prior. So uh, this, for example, uh, arises if you ask the question, is there a prior on this model um, that gives me um, the base estimator that's equal to the MLE? Okay, so can I, can I, for example, this is the MLE in this model, um, uh, the Gaussian location family is sample mean. Can I put a prior on theta uh, that give rise to posterior whose mean 
there is, is this again. And the answer is uh, not within the class of proper priors. So if you have a proper um, probability distribution that you want to put on theta, then no, but uh, that doesn't prevent people from uh, trying. So you would uh, try to put a prior. So this is effectively the equivalent of putting a uniform prior. So what you want basically is a uniform prior on theta. And if theta is um, uh, support like this in the entire real line, the uniform prior on, on the real line is the Lebesgue measure, which is not the probability distribution. It doesn't normalize to one, uh, but I'm going to put it there. So I'm going to uh, assume a prior which is proportional to one, although it doesn't normalize. I plug this in. Uh, I have the likelihood, which is uh, uh, going to be something like proportional to e to the negative, um, something like that, uh, xi minus theta squared divided by two sigma squared. So combine the likelihood and this. Uh, the posterior would be proportional to this quantity. Uh, and this quantity would, would normalize. So although the prior doesn't normalize, the posterior would normalize. So uh, this is going to be the post. This gives you the posterior, which is going to be proportional to the same thing. And that same thing is integrable. So you get a valid posterior. So these things are called improper priors. So it's a prior which is not a valid probability distribution, but once you combine it with the likelihood, it gives you a proper posterior. If you allow those, then yes. So it turns out that the mean of the posterior would be this instead of that. So this is the Bayes rule uh, or a Bayes estimator with respect to an improper prior. Um, alternatively, you can, so sometimes they're called generalized Bayes procedures. Now, alternatively, you can say, okay, this is the limit of Bayes rules. I can I can recover this as limits of proper base rules or as just the generalized base rule with respect to an improper prior. Um, sounds good. Just some basic idea. So the likelihood is sufficiently concentrated that allows you to um, make a proper posterior distribution. Um, okay. One more, like, uh, one slight point is uh, the, the uniqueness. So we talked about the existence of Bayes estimators. If you recall, uh, we had that general result that um, the Bayes estimator or the Bayes rule is the minimizer of the posterior risk. Uh, so this is a simple result uh, from Theory of point estimation, TPE stands for theory of point estimation. Um, that's the book. And um, gives you some conditions for uniqueness. Uh, if Q is the marginal distribution of X, so remember again, we specify the um, conditional distribution of theta given theta and the marginal distribution of theta. This gives me the joint distribution of X and theta which then gives me the marginal distribution of x by marginalization. Um, so this is like a formal way of writing it. So this is lambda. So let's say this is um, e theta. This is lambda. This gives me a joint distribution on x and theta. And this gives me a marginal distribution on x, which you can write it as formally as uh, weighted average of these p datas with the length being the prior. Um, so this delta lambda was the Bayes estimator. So delta lambda is argument or belongs to the argument. Um, so minimizes the Bayes risk uh, over all delta. So if the loss is strictly convex, for example, for a betting loss, and if the Bayes risk, which is the risk of the Bayes estimator, is finite, uh, and if Q almost everywhere is fine, Q almost everywhere, Q almost everywhere is, um, so this is the family, like a technical condition. So for example, if 
they all have the same support under some underlying measure. This is true. Uh, another way of saying it is that k-theta is absolutely continuous to q for all q, sorry, for all theta, uh, then there is a unique data set. So the key data space is convexity of the uh, loss function. Uh, I'm not going to dwell too much on this, but there is this result. If you care about optimal Bayes, like the uniqueness of the Bayes estimator uh, gives you enough to make a position We saw that, for example, for the um, non-convex um, loss. So if you have, for example, something like this, you would get uh, the argument would be um, the posterior median, and the posterior medians are not necessarily um, um, unique. Okay. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, so what I want to talk about today is uh, this idea of minimax and its relation to the Bayes approach. Okay, so um, back to the basic idea of comparing estimators uh, why are they risks. Uh, we were looking at two alternative approaches to summarizing the risk uh, function. So one was taking an average, weighted average, which is sort of equivalent to the Bayesian approach. And the other one, which is the frequentist approach, is to take the maximum soup of the risk. So this is the frequentist risk back to the original setting. And so I'm, I'm writing it as R bar. So this gives me a number, uh, and now I can try to minimize um, this number. So the estimator that minimizes the maximum risk is called the minimax estimator. and uh, it is um, so formally it's something like this. Okay. Um, minimizes the maximum risk. Uh, and I, I want to sort of uh, talk about this and, and see what the connection is, is to Bayesian approaches. So um, the idea turns out that you can find minimax estimators among Bayes procedures for particular priors. So it turns out that you can, you can, you can say that the minimax rule is a Bayes rule for a particular prior. Um, so I have a set of slides um, that I'm going to deviate a little bit from. So I'm going to not go through this. I'm going to come back. So what I realized doing would be, my, it would be better to do is to just jump into this part. So let's do it for the finite case first. Then I'm going to very quickly go over the general case. But the, the finite case uh, is going to be very informative because you see the geometry. There's a lot of geometry to this problem. And um, once you understand the finite case, hopefully the, the general case is straightforward. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to restrict myself to this finite set of parameters. So parameter space is finite. So you have a family of distributions as usual, um, p theta, uh, theta indexed by this omega, but we have like k distinct uh, um, elements. Okay, and what I would like to do is uh, um, I'm going to introduce some notations. Uh, so let's let's maybe work this out here. Uh, so I have the omega, right? So theta one up to theta k. Uh, so what I would like to do is um, so this uh, maximum risk that we wrote uh, is maximum, now it's going to be over uh, theta belonging to this omega, because it's finite soup is max, so it's like r theta and delta, right? And um, this is really the maximum uh, of a bunch of numbers, right? Theta one delta up to theta k delta, right? So in a, in a finite case, I'm just taking the taking an estimator. Uh, this is R delta. 
uh, the rest is just a number. I can I can basically um, collect these numbers into a vector for any estimator. Okay. So the risk function is really a vector and I'm calling this rho delta. Okay, so this would be a vector in R to the K. Okay, and in terms of this vector, how do I, how can I write this maximum? Is there any connection that you can see between them? Good. Yeah, you had a question? Oh, I was gonna say. Oh, great, great, okay. So you're on the same page then. So, so this is gonna be in the norm of this rho delta. Right? Um, now we're gonna make one more like abstract step, which is, um, so as I vary this delta, right? Uh, this vector is going to move from R to the K, uh, but it's going to have like, uh, like the constraint because it's an estimator and this is a risk. Uh, it's not going to carve out everything. So it's going to carve out um, a set. So I'm going to call this, I believe, D or S. Sorry, this is the S. Uh, it's going to be the set rho delta as delta varies in D. So this D is the set of all possible decision rules. And uh, so you can think of the D as um, just any decision rule that you can imagine is problem. Um, later on, we'll make it all randomized decision rules, but um, so actually let's, let's do that maybe. So, uh, I want to do that. Let's see. Um, yeah, let me, okay, let me. Um, in any case, so, so let's just have that. Okay. Um, uh, all deterministic decision rules. Let's say prime. And then I have S prime. So all this deterministic decision rules. So these are functions from X to omega, let's say. Okay. Um, and so I get this uh, S prime, let's call this the risk body, for example, if you want. Uh, so I get, um, I'm trying to uh, minimize. So the minimax problem is minimize delta in D prime. Uh, maximize theta in omega uh, r theta delta. So that's the minimax problem. Um, I've written this as minimum delta in d prime, um, rho delta infinity. So that's what we did up there. So that's, that's r bar. Okay. So far, so good. Uh, and then minimizing this over this is equivalent to minimizing uh, just, let's say, y infinity, y in S prime. So as delta varies, this move in that set, so if I call this y, basically I'm finding the risk vector y in this set of minimizing. So these two problems are equivalent. Yes. Could you define deterministic? I'm not sure what that term means. Uh, deterministic means the function from x to omega that is in uh, um, sort of in comparison to the, the randomized rules. Have you seen randomized rules before? We did. In what context do we see them? Couple of. Rob Blackwell, yes. So Rob Blackwell would say that um, uh, 
withhold for randomized uh, decision rules, and the conclusion was that for convex loss functions, randomization doesn't help. So randomization means my my rule would depend on so your estimator and the deterministic rule is just given in data. Uh, this is just number like the deterministic number. In a randomized rule, you just output something random. So there is an extra source of random. So um, you can tell think of delta x as uh, uh, you flip a coin and use your x to 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 decide. So if you just look at the x itself, the decision will look just like that. So, so this is clear. So one more step is uh, um, we might minimize it, so that's not necessarily. Um, So this problem is going to be a little bit difficult uh, because we're mi mi minimizing over a set which is not necessarily convex. But if this set turns out to be convex, this function is convex, then I'm minimizing convex function over a convex set. And that would be very nice. So what we can do is instead uh, look at the set of all possible decision rules, including the random, randomized ones. So if I do that, let's call that set S. Uh, so not convex. So let S be the set of all rho delta, uh, and then delta be um, in. Uh, D, where this is all possible rules, including randomized. So what would happen is um, this set is basically going to be the convex hall. Convex hall. Hall of S prime. So instead, we're going to look at this. The reason why this is going to be a convex hall because um, if I have to, um, so suppose I have um, delta one and delta two um, in deterministic decision rules, then um, the claim is that uh, if I want to form lambda uh, rho delta one plus one minus lambda rho delta two, uh, then this is going to be in uh, S. Uh, Okay. So for any delta, like for any deterministic decision rules, uh, if lambda is a positive number, or like lambda is in zero to one, then I can claim that this is in the set of all possible lists for all randomized decision rules. Uh, I just have to show a randomized rule for which this is the risk. So how can I? Yeah, lambda isn't random, it's like lambda is a number. Yes, but how is this a random number? Uh, this is not random. So I'm claiming that delta one and delta two are non randomized like deterministic decision rules. Uh, my claim is that, uh, so this is going to be in S prime. This is going to be in S prime. And this is a convex combination. My claim is that this convex combination is going to be in S. Yeah. Yeah, that would prove that, uh, at least it proved that. This contains a convex hall, and as a convex set, it turns out to be a convex hall. But but why this is true? Because I, this is the risk of a randomized estimate. Uh, what is this the risk of? Sorry, phase risk? No, no, no. This is a this is consider an estimator, uh, like a delta, uh, that outputs delta one x with probability. Lambda delta two x with probability one minus lambda. This is a particular way of randomization. I have two estimators. I'm going to switch between them by coin flip. Okay, if we could consider this, it's not a deterministic rule because you can't, like, once I pick a fixed x, I can't tell you exactly what the decision is. It turns out to be one of them. Uh, but if I do that, then the risk of this is easy to see that the risk is that 
if you do it for yourself, like you convince yourself, it's an expectation, and that can you condition on the source of randomness, double the Cairo product, right? You condition on there's a Bernoulli variable that is nice, and given that, you can get rid of that, and then you average this. Okay, so this idea is that randomization allows us to uh, go from this set, which is possibly not convex, to a set which is convex. Okay, so that's the use of random, like randomization. So instead of the original problem, I'm going to extend my horizon and look at all the possible decision rules within that class of all possible decisions, including random or flat. I'm going to uh, look for the minimax rule. So the problem would turn out to be now. Um, so I want to minimize now over the delta in D, which is the, all the decision rules, and then max um, theta delta. Uh, Theta in omega, so this turns out to be equivalent to minimize y in s, which is the the risk of all possible decision rules, and then this would be the s. Um, okay. We didn't do much; if we said just broaden. Now this problem is nice because omega. I mean, this is this is convex, and this is also convex. Uh, um, I showed that if you pick delta 1 and delta d and delta prime, then it comes next uh, combination with s. But you can also show that if you pick delta 1 and delta d, both are randomized. Um, then this is also be another randomized decision. You can use the procedure again. So uh, any convex combination of the risk of these estimate two estimators in the set is, again, the risk of another estimator, which, which is obtained by randomization. Okay. So you can always, um, you can just convince yourself that this set is convex. Again, the set of all risks of all decision rules, randomized decision rules is a convex set because I can get any, the, the, the convex combination of the risk of any two one by this sort of randomization. Yeah. Is this like, I, mean, like I, I get the convex relaxation of the problem, right? But yeah. is, is it like a link, like a terminology thing where if I just said, uh, we consider like the convex, all off like the set S prime. Would that be equivalent to what you're saying? Or is there something about the randomness that I'm using? Or at least you're basically doing convex relaxation. Is that okay? Right. I'm I'm doing a convex relaxation, yeah. So um the thing is it's I, I wanted to say this is equivalent to the convex relaxation, but it's not because it's a minimum. So if it was a maximum, when you maximize over a set, maximize a convex set over a set. It's the same as maximizing over the convex hall. This you can convince yourself. But minimizing over uh, a set is not equivalent to minimizing over a convex hall. So the problem is that this, this might be higher. Okay. But allow me to extend to all possible decision rules. Then I'll find the decision. So the, the, the second problem could have like a minimum which is smaller because I'm minimizing over about this. Uh, but as it turns out, we should be fine. Okay. Uh, so if I solve this problem and it turns out that the solution is a deterministic rule, then the two the, the two problems are the same. If I solve it, it turns out to be randomized, then there's a gap. Uh, but let's let's extend. So you're right. So this is a convex relaxation. There's no a prior I want to solve this. We're solving a different problem, uh, which is strictly smaller, the minimum smaller because you said it's bigger. But if it turns out that the solution is within this thing, the two are okay. Good. Uh, so far, so good. We just introduced some terminology, some notation. The only thing is like this convection relaxation, as was pointed out. Um, so this is the minimax problem. P1, if you want. Uh, now, I'm going to use uh, this idea of duality. This is a convex problem. This has a dual formulation. One knows what the dual formulation. What is the dual of? Dual norm one. Dual of uh, infinity is norm one. Yes, yeah. so I can write it as uh, minimum y and s max lambda y lambda l one being uh, less than one. So side note is this is duality. So 
that L infinity is equal to max over some dual variable, but this is the L1, the L1 norm. Um, lambda y. Okay, this is this is called. Uh, so this, if, if this solves, then this shows that the L1 is dual to the L1. Okay, I use duality. In this problem, let's say, assume that the risk is positive or non negative. So R, or the loss is non negative. Okay. Um, we run into the risk being non negative. All right, in that case, uh, the coordinates of Y, so this set is such that it's like completely in the Non negative order. It's all the coordinates are non negative. So I can draw the absolute values here. Right. I can. Uh, so if y basically, so let's say s is in, so y is in uh, s, which is a subset of, let's say, r positive to the k, uh, then I really don't need um, um, I can just say, uh, positive, so lambda being positive. And if lambda is positive, it just says that uh, one transpose lambda is less than or equal to one. Uh, and in fact, you can do this here equal to one. This is also equivalent because the maximum is gonna be attained at the boundary. If not, you just rescale it. Okay, so I can do this um, one. And then I can do this. Okay, so the reason why I can, uh, I can assume that the all the coordinates of lambda are positive because these guards are all positive. The maximum has to be in that direction. If they're all the coordinates are non-negative, and then and then if that's the case, then they have to sum to one. Okay. Now, if you look at this, then this is this is a probability vector. Now is a probability vector, uh, and then this has an interpretation. So, what is the interpretation of this? Lambda y is summation i from one to k. Lambda i y i. Expectation of. So lambda i. So lambda is you can think of it as a probability distribution, probability vector on the parameter state. You can have a coordinate. So this is the expectation of y. Uh, I, okay, so so this is the really the uh, um, so if you want to expand it, it's like lambda i um, r eta i delta. Okay, because these are the coordinates of y for some delta. So now, what is it? This is like expectation of r. Let's say theta delta. Uh, where theta is uh, distributed like lambda. So this is really the base risk. Is the base risk of the estimate by delta, whatever the delta that produces this. Assume the parameter has prior lambda. Okay, so this is the base risk. Okay. Another way of remembering is, remember like, you took the infinity norm of this risk vector, that's the maximum risk. I'm taking the average of the coordinates, weighted average is the base risk. Okay. It's just the weighted average of y i is the base risk, maximum is the maximum risk. Okay. So this is a side. Okay, so this is the connection between uh, minimax and max up to this point. So this is the basis. Um, now I want to what, what I want to do is I want to switch to all the strong duality. I do that. Uh, in general, you might have an inequality, but let's say it's equal. So if if this 
is valid, which in most cases, at least in this case, it would be valid because the problem is convex. Um, so I can switch min max and max in. So if you can make optimization, it's called strong variety. If the strong variety holds, which you can convince yourself that it holds, uh, then I get that solving the min max problem which is the minimax problem is, is equivalent to the maximum problem. Okay. So, uh, so what is this? Okay. It, it's the base, the Bayesian problem. So you're trying to find uh, the y equivalent to the, the decision rule that minimizes the base risk. Okay, so this, this the solution of this would be the risk of the base rule. Okay, so this is the Bayesian problem. So what this result is saying is um, take a prior, solve the base problem. So find the base risk. So this is the base risk for that. So this is our, um, in our in previous notation, it's like our lambda or um, we go back up, uh, way back up. Yeah, so this was our Bayes risk, the notation for Bayes risk. Um, go back further up, if you recall. Yeah, so this was our notation. So this is the Bayes risk associated with prior lambda. So that would be, um, so this is, this is remember the Bayes risk here. Here, lambda is just lambda, okay? So the expectation of our delta. So, uh, the, the minimum we uh, wrote as R lambda, right? So if you recall, uh, maybe not, maybe not, but uh, okay, so that's the notation. So let me use that notation here. Uh, here's this, right? So this is gonna be R. So in our notation, this would be sort of R lambda, uh, Delta, delta is the underlying one that gives you that y. And so this whole thing is gonna be uh, r lambda, delta lambda. Okay, so this is gonna be the Bayes uh, risk. In any case, so this is suggesting that we solve the Bayes problem for this lambda, and it has a um, um, uh, certain Bayes risk. Uh, and then I'm gonna choose the lambda which maximizes this Bayes risk. Okay, so the prior that maximizes the base risk, the optimal base risk, the minimum base risk, uh, is the prior that you can choose. And if you choose that prior, that that, that rule is going to be minimax. So maybe maybe the notation is bad, but so this is the, the, the optimal base risk. Optimal base risk. Right. So choose the prior, solve the Bayesian problem. So you know the, the, the Bayes rule, the, Bayes, the optimal Bayes risk. Oh, sorry, the optimal Bayes rule. So you find it, it has a Bayes risk, which is gonna be this minimum. You choose a different prior, right? You get a different uh, Bayes risk. You choose another prior, you get a different Bayes risk. And then you vary the prior or all possible priors, the one that maximizes this minimum Bayes risk, it's going to be the prior that gives you the minimax rule. So minimax problem is, uh, so this prior is called the least favorite prior, the prior that maximizes. So um, in, our, in my definition later, this is going to be R lambda. So this is the, the, the thing. So uh, the max over, so the, the maximizer would be, the prior, the prior lambda star that maximizes this is called the lambda star. So this, this lambda star is called the least favorite prior. It's called the least favorable prior. Least favorable prior. And if you find that prior, the Bayes rule associated with that prior would be in 
Okay, least favorable because it produces the worst case optimal page risk. Does that sound good? So there is an intimate relation between the minimax estimation and the Bayesian estimation by the strong divide. I'll let you maybe stare at it a little bit. So once I solve this, like I find like that this this dual problem, this is the dual problem. I solve this, I found I find lambda. And it sucks. Uh, then I can just go back and I can argue with all the sets and take the same thing. Well, hold it for So the solution of this part, I know, is a base rule. And, and so, uh, so basically, the base rule associated with that prior would be in that. Yes. Uh, so the goal of the mini max is to get both the base rule and the prior that makes it. Uh, no, the, the goal is not that. The goal is to, to find a decision rule that minimizes the maximum risk. But this analysis tells oh, you that the one that does it um, can be obtained as a ba base rule associated with least favorable prior. So among all priors, I'm going to put a prior that makes the base risk the worst, and the optimal base risk the worst. And that prior would lead me that lead to a, like the um, base rule, which is uh, sorry, which it leads to a base rule, which is turns out to be minimax as well. Okay, um, and everything here is nice. So this is the yeah, it, it's linear in both. It's like a bilinear function. Uh, these two sets are convex. This is really a simple convex set, but this is basically uh, duality in a like a convex set with a very simple class function. The uh, the R lambda star would be a deterministic estimator. How can we put that? Uh, I didn't say that. It, it turns out, right? Oh, it's uh, so you have to invert this. So this, the thing is, uh, once I solve this, I, this is at the level of risk, right? So this is, uh, so the, uh, so the minimum here uh, might be achieved by a random one group. That's uh, 85. Um, so we have just this one, right? Yeah, the starting line is fine. It's just that this, uh, because we're, we're working with the convex set, uh, the, the thing is, uh, so mapping back this this y, right? To, so the base rule here would be random. So like if, if this y turns out to be not achievable by the domestic rule, then you have. Um, let's see what I can do here. So what else do we need to talk about? I talked about this. Um, okay. Um, any questions about it? Yes. So this is, you find the risk if we put in a delta that minimizes it. So that problem is the Bayesian problem. Yeah, and then what's the point of as a, as a problem, like all the previous 
uh, I want to be able to like switch these two, and I need convexity like, for convex problem. Max, max mean yes. Otherwise, this is this in general is true. This is always gonna. Uh, let's not worry about that. So this is like a like a convex optimization. Like just look up like the starting quality in convex optimization. There are many different uh, possible uh, like conditions. Okay. Uh, in this case, uh, so these are these are called the Leo max of appearance. And um, for example, if this is found that the compact convex, and this is compact convex, then it will move through. Uh, this is white not be kind of like uh, compact, but, but in our case, uh, uh, I'm, I'm gonna like maybe ignore the constraint, like or the, the conditions. Okay, so it's just at the high level, we want to just get the picture. Um, in practice, you're not going to use this to drive the minimax um, because we can't optimize over this surface. But if this is kind of like sufficiently nice. Then I believe it's one of them is compact is enough. So I you can look it up, try to figure out what there are multiple ways of arguing. But this also assumes the This assumes that the uh, optimization problem you're doing is sorry, the the parameter space is discrete. Yeah, but we're we're lambda because the parameter space is discrete, yes. Um, I'm going to give you the general result. Like the general result is not solving this, but there is like sufficient conditions. So if you find, um, so the other like observation is that if you find a prior whose maximum risk, uh, so you, you find a prior. Uh, you have a base rule, uh, a base estimator that has a um, base and base risk and a, ma a maximum risk. Um, okay, so we have a base rule associated with a prior that has uh, a base risk and a maximum risk, and it turns out that. Uh, uh, So let's, do, let's do it later, so it's a little bit more tricky. Um, so we want to say everywhere that the prior puts mass, um, uh, let, let, me, let me show you that, that result later. Is, is there any question about this? Uh, Let me push this geometric picture a little bit before before keep going to the general case. Um, so th this gives you the idea that this least favorable prior is important. And I want to maybe do a more geometric picture. So what will happen is, um, so let's say this is a risk body. Um, Let's say my risk body is something like that. Okay. Let's say convex set. Um, so the problem, original problem, so this is the set S, um, is trying to minimize um, this um, infinity norm. Okay. So if I want to uh, visualize this geometrically, okay. Um, I can try to visualize the level sets of the infinity norm. Okay, and then the level sets is the set of all y's for which they have the same infinity norm, and then vary these level sets. Okay, see when I leave, like where I intersect the set S and when I leave the set S. So what would happen if I try to write, like plot the level sets of the infinity norm? Just let's say, for example, this is the like 
here we are, we are looking at a uh, parameter space with two elements. Okay, so the risk body is R2. Uh, so what is like the infinity equal one? What is the set? What does the set look like? Yeah, so it would be something like that. One, one. So then, then it goes away, like all the way, but on the positive part, it looks like this. Okay. What happens if I change this number? So increase it, it would be like that, right? And I start to decrease it. So there's this 45 degree line, right? These all pass through that. I should have maybe be a little more careful. So they all intersect this. Uh, so I'm going to decrease it, and at some point, I'm going to hit the boundary, okay? This point is the point in S with the smallest L infinity node. If I reduce it further, the level says I'm going to be outside. Okay, so you change these, and you're going to, um, at some point, hit the boundary. So that would be the minimax. The risk of the minimax, okay, so that's the minimax estimator. Or the risk of the minimax estimator, okay? Sounds good. So now suppose I want to find a Bayes rule associated with a um, 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 prior, which, which is solving this problem. So I fix a prior and I want to solve this. So this is going to be a linear function in y, right? The function of y. So if I want to solve an associated base, uh, like base problem associated with a, with a prior lambda, what would it look like on this picture? So what are the level sets of this quantity, like this, this object? So x lambda. Uh, what are the y's such that lambda transpose y is equal to, say, c, the constant? What does this mean? Not the 45 degree line. This is a line perpendicular to. No, I'm going to give you lambda. Lambda, I, I don't specify. So this will depend on lambda. Can you describe what this set is? It's a line perpendicular to lambda. So if I specify lambda, for example, like that, then all the lines perpendicular to this is going to are going to be level sets of that. So I'm going to move these uh, basically the other way around. So these are all level sets. And I move them until I hit the boundary here. Okay, so that would be the base rule associated with uh, with the with this prior okay um that's the part of the main lines and then when you maximize that point you need to record it the so I choose this uh, prior and minimize it. I hit this. If I change the prior, right? I change the prior, it would be a different set of lines. Let me not do that. Uh, uh, um, if I if I choose a different prior, let's say. So a different set of prior, maybe uh, this would be uh, my uh, new vector. So it would be these lines. And the first time I hit, this is going to be the base rule associated with that. So I'm going to change these priors. And uh, every time I hit, I hit one, 
Um, and if you imagine, once I do this, I can hit every part of this boundary. I can't hit this part. I'm going to hit this part of the boundary uh, with these basal. And one of them would be the minimus. So there is um, uh, a particular prior that if I choose, when I'm going to hit, I'm going to hit this point. Okay. So that prior would be least favorable. And so the, this, this shows the geometry. So the um, the minimax risk is is like the minimax risk is this one here, and the base rules are, are on this side of the boundary. And one of them, if I choose the right prior, uh, maybe it would be this. Um, there is there is a prior. There is a direction when I like I'm gonna hit. I'm gonna hit perpendicular here, and I'm gonna hit this. Okay, so that that would be the prior socially um, least favorable. Uh, prior. Okay, so that's uh, the geometric picture. Also Sorry? This also uh, How does it prove? Uh, because the ultimate thing that you just solved for is the dual, and the first one is the final problem, and the final star and the dual star is a judicial. Yeah, it would prove a strong log if you can really hit. Yeah, yeah. In, this in this particular example, yes, because I can, I can, yeah. Uh, so, right. So, if I can, for example, if the problem was like this, let's say um, my risk body was like this, right? Uh, I cannot like this, but it's this. Uh, right, yeah, it's like a Pac-Man, right? If it was like that, uh, maybe wider. So when I'm coming down, right, uh, I'm gonna hit maybe uh, this position. Yeah, so this is gonna hit this point, let's say. So that would be the minimax rule. If that that's the convex set that we're looking at, no, not convex, but the, the risk body that we're looking at is this, right? That's one um, approach. So that's the risk body. So this would be the minimax, but I can't achieve it with a base rule. So. And I'm coming down. Whatever you do, you're gonna look. So these lines always see the convex set. So they're not ne never gonna like they're gonna hit this point or this point. Uh, but from the perspective of the line, this looks like a convex set. You're never gonna hit this. So that that would fail. But for convex problems, if the problem is convex, uh, so you can convince yourself that this is gonna be dual. Okay. That's sort of geometric way of saying. Strong log. Right. Yes. Do is it just these examples or do we do we expect the minimax to lie in the point that we need to The minimax is gonna be in this problem where the two dimension is always in the 45 degree line because that's like these are the level sets. Right. So that's true. The, the minimax is gonna be always in this line because uh, it's going to be on, it could like if it, okay, so you could hit, yeah, you're right. So it could hit this part. That's also true. It's, it's going to be on this and this, if not on always on the, the 45 degree, right? Um, the one that's on the 45 degree is is called the like equalizer. Uh, it's, it's, it's a rule for which uh, all the risk values are the same. Um, We'll see this guy later. Uh, but yeah, it could be like you, you could hit this part. If the risk body is very strange, uh, this couldn't for, for, for convex problems doesn't happen necessarily. But um, yeah, so is it, yeah, okay. For, for convex problem, it could be, it's not necessarily. So you could, um, 
I don't know. You could imagine, I don't know if this is going to happen, but let's see. Something like this. So if the risk body looks like that, then you're going to hit this part. Okay, it's not necessarily all of it. Uh, but it turns out that uh, in a lot of cases, maybe, uh, we'll see. I mean, this point is is what, what, what does, uh, or at least the ones that you can solve easily uh, is when you hit this part. So is the geometric sort of picture clear? Um, so what I want to say more is, uh, so you can see that these Bayesian procedures cannot realize. So there is a part of this boundary that they can hit. Uh, and there, there are parts that are not going to be. So we're not, not we're never going to have a Bayes uh, optimal rule that's here. Okay. So for example, I'm not going to ever see something here because when I, when I change it, always I'm going to be like minimized on this. So there is a phase of this um, that that the base rule sort of sits on. Uh, and then I, I want to maybe say a few words about, okay? So, so far, so good. Geometry of base and minimax. Uh, but the base rules have a, a more uh, natural place. So that's the idea is uh, sort of in this setting, um, um, if the problem parameter is finite and it does it in admissible, then they tell that it's going to be a base rule with respect to some prior, and that face is the face of admissible estimators. Okay, so uh, that's what I want to like argue. So um, base rules and admissibles are basically one and the same in this case. Um, so let's see what an admissible rule is. So suppose I have this. Uh, Risk body again. Um, so, what does admissibility mean? Admissibility means um, that if I look at an estimator here, so these are risks. So these are risks of risk estimators. So again, like here, we're we're looking at this problem, um, and and so this is the risk of a particular estimator. So this is really r theta one. Delta, this is R delta, theta two, delta. So any estimator uh, like that that's inside this body. So this this estimator, for example, is not admissible. Why this is like the estimator that produces this risk is not admissible? Because let's say let's say this is we're looking at the entire sort of the solid body. So all of these uh, are realizable. Okay, by a randomized estimate. Uh, why this is like the estimator that, that sits here is not? Definitely you can find another estimator that has smaller risk. Group. Yeah, so anything here would have risk that like in both parameters are bent, right? So, so anything on, on, on this side, so the intersection of this, so if you like, pass lines through this point and go all the way to infinity at the intersection uh, of this with, with this risk body, right? Anything that sits there uh, is gonna be, uh, so let's call this, anything that sits here at the intersection of this uh, is gonna be a, uh, um, like a certificate of inadmissibility. So you can see again that Okay, so what would happen is that I have to, uh, so I have to move this. So I have to like have this set and then move this until I hit this boundary, at which point then there is nothing left. For example, if I move it until I'm gonna hit here, then this rule is gonna be admissible, okay? Because there is nothing in there like the admissibility, let's say cone or whatever you wanna call it. Okay. Or I can move it in this direction, uh, I'm gonna hit this part. Or in any case, so as you move it, you're going to hit the boundary. So the things that are in this boundary, are going to be, so uh, there is this face, not face, but uh, there's this part of it, which is um, um, telling you, um, so something like this, uh, if you go all the way, I believe, uh, maybe up to this point. So anything here would be, 
uh, admissible, but anything else would be inadmissible. So, so the admissible estimator sit on this pi. Right. Um, so my claim now is, is that uh, if, if you're admissible, uh, then um, you're also a base rule in this case. Uh, what, it, what it means is that all of these can be realized by some prior, like the, as the minimum, uh, uh, as the optimal rule with respect to some prior. That's what I want to argue. Uh, and this is an, a very interesting sort of argument in convex analysis. So we're going to form this as suppose both ends are admissible. I'm sorry, admissible. Uh, so let's call x to the risk of it. So that's maybe I'm looking at uh, this guy maybe here. Uh, so this is x, the risk of the admissible estimator. This is x. Um, we actually have a time, let's just something really quickly. So we're going to look at this x and then remove it by look at all the qx is this, is this, this, okay. Um, so we're going to look at this, and the idea is that I can separate this set from that. So this is the convex set. This is the convex set. There is a separation. Okay. So there's a hyperplane separating the two by a general resulting convex analysis. If I have two disjoint convex set, then there exists a hyperplane that separates. And then you can argue for yourself that this, like this, has to be the normal has to be uh, coordinates have to be positive. Uh, because of the way that this sits, otherwise we can just like this if it's negative. So the coordinates have to be, and then this will give you, once you normalize it, give you a prior. So this will give you a prior, it allows you to say this is a major respect to prior. I'll let you, if you have time, I'll, I'll let you go through this. But the main idea is that because there are two convex sets, I can find a separating hyperspace. Uh, and normal to that, I can argue that the coordinates are positive. Then I, if I normalize it, it will be a prior. And it turns out that then the rest is just followed. The fact that things are separated means that this is a base rule. Um, so maybe you can go through the argument next time more and more easily, but that, that's sort of an interesting fact. The next accessibility to Bayesian base rule via this sort of geometric picture. Okay, sounds good. So base rules and admissible rules are sort of the same, uh, at least in this finite case. And minimax rules are also Bayes with respect to some prior, which is so the class of Bayes rules is interesting. Okay. Questions, comments? Okay, let's come back next time and wrap up with those things. Uh, thank you.